So first of all, uh, oh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will not say much about myself anymore. Um, I would like to share with you um, a few things that I've learned over the years with respect to um, academic entrepreneurship. So, like this, yeah? Oh, that's better. Yeah, but I, I stay, otherwise it's getting too, it's getting too hot. So, um, uh, as the, the vice rector already said, I, in the Netherlands, I chair the combined centers for entrepreneurship uh, of universities and universities of applied science, which are 23 or so. Uh, so, I will, I'll talk a bit about academic entrepreneurship from, from a practical experience also on, uh, for the last 10 years what we have encountered. So my first slide is a bit like an organizing slide of what, what do I mean with that, which is small. I think it's important to, to, to what are the elements of what I would call academic entrepreneurship. So which are the, I would say, strategic levers that you would need to understand the role of universities with respect to, well, entrepreneurship and innovation. And it's important to start from the bottom here. So at the lo lowest level, not the least important of course, but the lowest level is how you conduct entrepreneurship in education for students. And I'll start to say a few things about that. The next layer is if students want to become or staff want to become entrepreneurs themselves, how do you deal with issues like incubators and accelerators? A level above that, is what you would call technology transfer or technology transfer offices. So more knowledge flowing out of universities. You can see that entrepreneurship education and incubation is one form of getting knowledge out of university in terms of entrepreneurship, but you also have licensing, IP, research contracts, which is a broader set. So these three are, let's say, within the academia itself. But I think it's very important to realize that if you want to have successful entrepreneurship and successful, um, let's say, technology transfer, you need connections with what you would call an entrepreneurial ecosystem at the city level. So it's not only that you have things within university, but it's also important how the university engages with the region. And lastly, and I think it's an underestimated effect, there is one layer above this which has to do with what are on a national level, of course Russia is much bigger than the Netherlands, but what is actually the policy environment at the highest level to support these activities. So you have an integration of, from, let's say, what you do within class to what policies is. And I think that the successful element of success of academic entrepreneurship, if you are in Tomsk, have to do with the combination of these factors. So what I will do, I've made a few checklists simply to talk with you about it. It's not that I'm going to lecture with a lot of slides. It's just for me and for you to organize a few things about what I think is important. And I start with entrepreneurship education and then I move up to the other levels, and I simply concentrate on a few things which I think over the years I thought were, uh, have been quite important. I mean, have been, have been a challenge. So I start with entrepreneurship education. So I made a bit of a checklist, in the sense that if you, if you were to say, look, how successful is entrepreneurship education in the university? What kind of boxes should we check? So what kind of things should we check? And, and, and the, first, the first box is that in many universities, maybe not so many universities in Russia, but many universities in Europe, Western Europe and in the US, entrepreneurship has much difficulties of getting out of the business schools to other faculties. Whereas these other faculties, especially with respect to technology, are probably the most important parts for entrepreneurship. So a big challenge 
and you have to have very active policy on that, is to make entrepreneurship education university-wide, funded university-wide. And that's a challenge, because often it is in the business school and the, tech, the, 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 the engineering school doesn't want to pay for services from the economics, etc. These kind of things are very difficult to organize. But there, I would like to stress another point, which is, so we, most of the people know this, but you have many students in economics and business who have no idea about technology. So there is another element, whereas if you talk about business schools and entrepreneurship schools, that you have to make these people also aware of technological trends to be good entrepreneurs. So you can also approach it from another thing. So the first element is, if you want to check entrepreneurship education is, do you set it up in a university-wide way? I think the second thing what is important in academia in general, or if you talk about is whether you use methods in entrepreneurship education which you would call a global language. So if people talk to other people from other countries or other universities, do you have the curriculum and let's say the setup that is that at least has some common elements. So it, uh, the, the common language is the business model canvas, the lean launchpad, so do you use the techniques? I think what is important is that in the last 10 years we know much better in ed entrepreneurship education what works and what does not work. So these methods are actually quite well documented and can be used and do you use these kind of things. So often, and to put it in the other way, is that if you look at engineering schools doing entrepreneurship, actually often they do accounting. These kind of things. They don't do entrepreneurship. Eh? So they do business or management. And they call it entrepreneurship because they say entrepreneurship is actually business skills for engineers. And I think what's important is that you move beyond that and look really at entrepreneurship training and not so much business. So that's my second thing. The third thing is that entrepreneurship is to explore things, to discover things. And that's a big challenge. How do you organize entrepreneurship education? Because often you have accreditation, you have courses, you want to give grades, but entrepreneurship is not giving grades, it's letting people explore it. So a big challenge is whether you give simply students not grades, but free time to explore things and these to develop their soft skills. So on the one hand, uh, it should be a course, but it should give more freedom to students to explore things than in normal courses. Okay. My fourth bullet with respect to entrepreneurship education is use a lot of variety. Don't use only a simple course at the beginning or an incubator at the end. You can use challenges. You can use all kinds of other things. So you, you can use a whole wide range of educational elements for entrepreneurship education. Often, people focus on the course, whereas if you work with the city or if you work with large companies, you can, can be very creative in, in organizing entrepreneurship type of elements in the curriculum. Next bullet, I'm going to speed this up also a bit, is what we often forget is that for good entrepreneurship education, you need good entrepreneurship teachers. Um, often these people come from abroad, but one strategy is that if you have later on incubators, etc., is how entrepreneurial is the staff, how entrepreneurial are PhDs. So instead of only focusing on entrepreneurship education for students, maybe universities should also focus a bit more on entrepreneurship education for staff and supporting staff to become entrepreneurs because that makes them also better entrepreneurship teachers. So, and the last thing with entrepreneurship education is 
uh, especially if you are in a strong science-based university like Tomsk, but I'm also in Utrecht, we have a bit the same type of profile, is do other disciplines value entrepreneurship as a discipline? Often people see this as something which is unscientific, which, is, which should not belong to the core curriculum in university, that these people, well, it's not an academic type of activity, so it takes a lot of talk across university to have entrepreneurship education recognized, especially outside of the economics department, as something that is actually valuable in an academic area. So this is not here, that is all everywhere is a problem and it takes years and years of talking. So that is, that are I think quite a few important lessons if you want to implement entrepreneurship education. So what is, so the next step I think, what is important to, to realize, maybe as an overarching thing, is that if you set up centers for entrepreneurship, so I've been across, then there are basically two things that you can do. So first is to talk about entrepreneurship education, but the other thing is to make sure that students actually become entrepreneurs, which is a diff difficult question. Uh, you can teach them, but how do they become entrepreneurs? So a second job is to make sure that around university there is an organization where students who want to become entrepreneurs can actually land. And the question of chicken and egg is quite important. Where do you start? Do you first start with building science parks, ecosystems around university and after that you start to become engaged in entrepreneurship education or do you do entrepreneurship education without students actually can become entrepreneurs so there is a complementarity between those uh, between those areas which is not that trivial so one of the let's say the most important steps is to set up incubators I think I think people set up incubators but what I've learned over the years is that you really need to have a clear business model for the incubator itself. Um, so what do I mean is that people set up a building and this building is often something that they don't use. Uh, they put some IT cables and some IT support in it and they plug in a lot of startups but it's actually because the building is there tem on a temporary basis that they start an incubator. But that's not a sustainable business model for an incubator. So when you do that, you have to ask yourself, okay, the incubator is a company itself. What is the business model for the incubator? Basically, there are three types of business models for incubators. The first is that you pay rent for the offices. So it's simply office space. And the other ones are much more sophisticated, are what you would call equity models or sales models. Equity models means that you let uh, startups come into the university. Remember you take an, an equity position in them, so if they s are sold to a venture capitalist you earn back your money. Or you have a sales model where you say, okay, I don't take an equity position, but if they start selling things, we levy a tax on the startups. You cannot have all three of them easily. So make a choice what kind of business model for incubators you would actually want. Now, it depends also a bit on your context. So for example, if you know that there are lots of people who, f f who will buy, want to buy uh, startups, having equity shares looks nice because you make a lot of money at university, but it also makes selling these firms much harder to venture capitalists. So often what you'd say is that if you take a part of their sales, it's easier for the entrepreneurs to sell equity shares to future venture capitalists. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't think there's much literature on this. I don't think, so this is a really a nice research area also to know more about how these kind of evolving business models for incubators actually work. Uh, uh, but their success really depends on these. The second thing, what I've learned about incubators is how well are they aligned with what the university is actually good at. 
So universities can be broad, but often they have three or four specialities. So a strategic choice with respect to incubators is whether you have, let's say, only two or three areas where you support startups in the incubator. Where do you focus or where you not focus on startups, which is a choice. And so often I see many incubators do everything, so it's simply you can start your business there, but they don't have any focus. I think in Utrecht, where I come from, when we started on IT and education, when we started on health, had a clear focus, it started to work a bit better. I think that's the third one. So the, th the third bullet is, does the incubator distinguish between students and entrepreneurs? Because entrepreneurs don't like students. So entrepreneurs want to be entrepreneurs. They want, and if, if you have all kinds of students running around entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs see it as some kind of a student association and that they don't like. So make the choice whether you have student entrepreneurs or young graduates or whether it is about serious entrepreneurs also coming from outside of university into the university to make use of science. So that profile, whether it is students or non-students, is an important question for the incubator. If you do everything, it will be a mess. You often see also that on that incubators work in layers, so the first layer is for students, second layer is for, let's say, start startups, third one is for serial entrepreneurs, so that you make a difference across these kind of things. Then it's important how do you engage angels and entrepreneurs. Um, so so the, the, what the, not the last, but before that, I think that many what I see across Europe is that many incubators go bankrupt. So they get two or three years where they get free housing from your university or some city. Then they have to pay it themselves and then they go bankrupt because they don't have a business model to support it. Startups, many of them fail, uh, cannot pay the rent. So what you see is that the only real money maker for incubators is to work with large corporates in open innovation. So connect innovation activities of corporate firms with students and startups for disruptive innovation. What I would always advise is to start with that from the start. So I've seen many, especially now in Berlin, if you, if you go there, it's, it's a bit of a thing what people do is that actually they start off as co-working spaces working with open innovation and out of that create startup uh, uh, incubators instead of the other way around because the competition to attract open innovation nowadays is much bigger than for startups itself uh, so probably start with it and don't don't try to do it after three The next is about entrepreneurship, but a broader question is how do you organize as a university actually the commercialization of your knowledge? So startups for students and staff, etc., are a way to do this, but there are many other ways. And what we see more and more is that universities have a holding in which they have intellectual property, that they have research support offices which are specialists in conducting research contracts with firms. So, so how do you organize that? So the first basic question, I'm not so sure, but I guess in, uh, here it must be a bit the same, is many researchers don't like commercialization. They simply don't see it as the reason why they joined a university in the first place. And I think that also in Utrecht, 
very strong natural science based. If we talk about commercialization, the basic thing that a lot of people, the majority of researchers tell me, we don't want to have that because if we would like that, we, I would have started working for Philips 20 years ago or for Shell or for Unilever. The fact that I didn't do so, there was a reason for that. So an and a, a, a big problem with respect to commercialization in the university area is this type of identity thing, that, that people have a strong identity with respect to fundamental research and they cannot square this with commercialization. My only thing is, don't take this too simple. In the Netherlands, we have many professional boards of university who come from, the, from business and they start telling the deans they start telling the faculties that they should become engaged in commercial research to fund universities. This simply does not work. If you don't, if you don't do this in a nuanced way, uh, it will not land in university. So that's, let's say, a caveat. I think that, that many scientists have insufficient incentives to, to disclose information. So I, that's what I see. So, so you, you really make sure bec before you do this technology transfer that yeah, that people can earn money actually do the, doing this. Otherwise, they do it themselves. Uh, so what are the incentive structures that you have? Big problem. Um, the fourth one I also like to stress is that, again, this is a problem very much in, uh, in, in, the, in the Netherlands, uh, where I come from, is that we have technology transfer officers who are legal experts. But they are not business experts. So they know how to make a contract, they don't know how to sell research. And often this is also a cultural kind of thing. How do you make a, a well-functioning technology transfer office, which starts off as a legal, legal department of the university towards much more a business department of university? Okay. So these are a bit like the things like entrepreneurship education, incubating, and technology transfer type of issues. Uh, that, that are the three core elements with respect to academic entrepreneurship. So, and, and clearly there are connections. If you have entrepreneurship education, you should make sure that, that students can actually set up their companies later. But if they set up their companies, they have to deal often with intellectual property that belongs to university. And how have you organized that in a technology transfer office? So these are then the three uh, connections. Now I would like to move beyond, let's say, the within university towards more the ecosystem approach. So I think that, that this type of structure is a bit the standard structure that people discuss if they talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems at the regional level. And um, what is important, so, so these are, let's say, the six important elements uh, that people would say what a, what a system should look like. But I first would like to, um, to say something more philosophical about it. A few years ago, there was a fantastic book by Brad Feld, and Brad Feld wrote about a, a book, a very, very um, well, light-hearted book. He moved from Boston and his wife um, was sick and he moved to, uh, to, to, to Colorado because of the healthy air there. And he started in Boulder. And the book is about how Boulder became as a city, it's a bit like Tomsk, how it became really a, a big entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, and uh, he, so it's, 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 it's a fantastic read. But one of the things is that there should be leaders in these systems and there should be feeders. So who, who leads the system and who feeds the system? Now, this is a difficult question. If you think about, if you want to set up an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Tomsk, who should lead it and who should feed it? Now, everybody would immediately shout that the leaders should be entrepreneurs. The feeders 
should be local government and universities. But there are practical problems because entrepreneurs not necessarily think in terms of the common interest. Universities often do. So you end up quite quickly in a second best situation where effectively universities are the only ones who can lead the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So local government often is too pragmatic and often too political. Universities are political, but governments are also. So often universities have the resources, the building, the people, the common interest to lead it. But how do they connect to entrepreneurs who from a content perspective should lead it? So that is, that is often very difficult in building the ecosystem is that on the one hand you facilitate, you more or less lead, but you want to bring in others and not to dominate it. So, so now what are important elements of, um, of entrepreneurial ecosystems? And I put it as overlapping. Is of course on top I start with human capital. Uh, so if you think about the, the thing, what makes a system a system at the regional level, you need human capital, you need launching markets, so companies that actually buy from startups. You need support systems, so if you cannot make a contract or don't have uh, cheap accountants, etc., it's very difficult to become an entrepreneur. You need supporting policies, uh, in, especially also infrastructure. You also need the right culture, so how much is entrepreneurship appreciated in your region. And clearly, you need financial conditions for entrepreneurial ecosystems to work well. Now, the, the thing is, how do these elements work together? And often there are a few things which are problematic. So it could well be that, so in Tomsk, you have human capital, but the launching markets are in Novosibirsk. That already may be a bit of a problem. Uh, um, the culture is academic, but uh, you need a different type of culture as well. So how do these wor things work together? Uh, um, and um, so then you have a few things. So, so, so if you look at the back, I think that what works really well in areas is that if you're a university, so how can research work if you know already a few successful entrepreneurs in this region and you write studies about them because these kind of stories of successful entrepreneurs let them give lectures become very important binding things in your entrepreneurial ecosystem it's not good for university per se but you need stories entrepreneur x from tomsk is doing that and has worked there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you can document that as a university, that is a nice way of building the ecosystem. Another way is that many successful entrepreneurs in the region often are your alumni of the university. So if you have angels, so angel investors, or getting people, let's say, who are your alumni and bring them back to your entrepreneurship students, these kind of things can help the culture and the ecosystem a lot. Think about what is called oil men. So we have the vice sector here, but there are often a lot of people in... in, in um, so for me in Utrecht, they say all parties in Utrecht, we always see Heim. So university often has people who know more people than others in the system, they know them from government, these connections, they know alumni businessmen. So often a role for universities is to really support what you would call the oil man of these kind of systems to go to all kinds of dragon dance, receptions, etc., etc., because that is important to connect uh, the elements. So it's really a social constructure, constructual type of thing how you build such an ecosystem. Also from a, re from a research perspective, 
it is good to, to think about Tomsk or Utrecht in terms of what you would call structural holes in a sense is that what are we missing? Clearly we have the human capital but we might miss something like launching markets because many of the strategic things start with realizing where your weaknesses are. So with such a tools like entrepreneurial ecosystems you can assess what things are actually missing and you can work on that. So I've moved from entrepreneurship education to incubation to technology transfer and to organizing the area, the ecosystem around it. So this is at the, let's say, the regional level. So my last, my last piece is this step to the national level and national policy type of level that should also be supportive in such a structure. And this will probably also be small, so let me go over it. I've done a bit of this exercise for the Netherlands, of which, of course, I have a bit more information. But I'll tell you something about the Netherlands and what we did. So, in the Netherlands, um, we have, so first of all, this is, we have the universities to the left, and we have sectors to the top. Now, what happened in, in 2000, 2007, we had the financial crisis, and one of the elements of the financial crisis in the Netherlands was that there was no money for research anymore. Now, Utrecht was at that time the top innovative region in Europe. So we got a lot of pressure from the government saying, okay, we should shift research from Philips Unilever in Foods to the universities. And then we set it back to the large companies. So out of that came the first policy at the national level, which was called top sectors. So we identified in the Netherlands actually these sectors that you see on top as the strategically more and most important sectors. Of course, there was a huge discussion on this, whether these were the important sectors, but it was the sectors that it started with. So that's a national policy priorities, as I would call it. Then the second question is, okay, we should move in a second program, which is called valorization, and I shared that for Utrecht. How do we refocus universities on, let's say, creating research that supports these top sectors? And because we should focus which university do, should do what? And the third element is what, you, what we call Startup Delta, which is a program across hubs, ecosystems, to support startups. Now the big question is, is that if you look from a national program, what you would like is that top sectors, universities, and startups are well aligned from a national policy perspective. And that's a big question. Now, sadly, so we try to score this with a lot of experts. And in the table, if you have you, a B, business and startups, so you have universities, B, areas as well. But also if you think about Eindhoven, uh, so that, that is actually in high tech. And um, uh, Wageningen in, in agriculture. <coughs> but we actually, <coughs> this shows us that if you have this type of entrepreneurship, that out of these immense amount of high profile universities that the Netherlands have, all in the top 100, actually only a few were well positioned to follow uh, this thing. Now, it is also no surprise that Delft, Eindhoven, 
En Wageningen are technical universities. They are not science universities per se. The conclusion is that all general universities fail to do this well and fall out. So, so what we see is from, let's say, a startup environment, only, let's say, these well-aligned are doing well at the moment from academic entrepreneurship on top of, so yes, you have Amsterdam, but Amsterdam is very international, very creative, but it's not science-driven in that sense. Uh, so, okay, so this is th to make clear that these kind of things are not so, not so easy to establish uh, if you want to have it right over the whole thing. So if you, if you move that back, I think there's another element that we did out of this type of study because um, why, why, why was it so, why was the Netherlands doing so, so why was it so badly organized? <laughs> so why did I perform, why didn't this work? So, uh, so how, and we came up, so what we did was an exercise, and this is also very small, but it, it actually because, so we, we did in the middle, you see the, the ecosystem type of elements, and we saw all the organizations who at a national level were working on this. An immense amount of organizations. So, so we had a huge amount of organizations working on this at the national level or maybe your federal level, but not at the level of cities, universities. We had a complete soup <laughs> of initiatives who all had subsidies which were not connected to cities. So you'd say, look, we first have to break down all these national elements bring them back to the city level to align them with that type of policy. So, um, well, <laughs> and this will keep us busy for another 10 years in a sense like uh, uh, how, how to make an effective national type of, uh, um, of strategy out of this. Okay, so to wrap this up, my talk, I think I've, if you talk about uh, academic entrepreneurship, is um, um, yeah, the, um, the main elements that I've talked about. I think that on top, uh, it's important to strive for what I would call universal access of entrepreneurship education across the university. And that's a big challenge because you work from pockets where it works to a university-wide program. And in all universities that I've seen, this is a big challenge. We have entrepreneurship masters, we have entrepreneurship courses in the business school, but to integrate them in the engineering school and to combine them with useful masters in the engineering school, that's a big challenge. So that's, that's the first thing. The second is to make these kind of inclusive incubators with a clear revenue model. I've talked about that, that a lot of people think about getting students into incubation out of education, which is important. But don't forget that to make Incubate successful is that you share knowledge of universities by inviting entrepreneurs into your university using these incubators. So this tends to be a very diverse set of incubators. And how this works is not that trivial on how you manage that. So the third one is this transparent technology transfer function. So how does commercialization of university knowledge work. This needs a lot of documents. This needs a lot of decision making at the level of universities to get a clear structure because otherwise it will be misused by a lot of professors with good information, good access to, to business. So how to make that process transparent, not easy. If you talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems, then we all know that universities should not lead the ecosystem, but we do. <laughs> and how do we take up the task of doing this in the right way, not being entrepreneurs ourselves? Because actually there's nobody else who can do it in the short run. And I think that's the big, big challenge. 
And then the last thing is, how well is your regional setting embedded in a national strategy and how focused are you with respect to this kind of smart specialization? So to me, these are, let's say, the key, let's say, challenges for designing an effective type of entrepreneurship, uh, academic entrepreneurship type of setting. Okay. Questions? Yep. Спасибо большое за такой состоятельный доклад. Let me see. Can you say something? Maybe. Thank you very much for this detailed report. Okay. <laughs> I don't hear it. So let's do it later, that way. Okay, but I don't, I don't, I don't seem to. Which this one? Maybe. Maybe. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Вопрос следующий. Меня заинтересовала история. Вы сказали, что на уровне города история. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't hear an English uh, text. So let's do it in English. Different channel? One, two, three. Um, I think that um, um, the municipality was actually uh, quite helpful. Um, we have actually two layers. We have the, 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 the province and the city. The city always is hell. The province doesn't know really what to do, so they will help you because that gives them a bit of a task. So I don't know whether it's the same here. But I think uh, I, I've come across many reasons where it is actually the same. I think what it helped us a lot, and uh, we had an, a mission from Tom's coming to Utrecht. In the Netherlands, we set up economic boards. We set up economic boards in Utrecht, Amsterdam, Rotterdam. And effectively what the province did was to shift, let's say, initiative in economics to these, to these economic boards. They don't have much budget, but they were consisting of all the players in the ecosystem. So the trick was that they set up the economic boards where they actually created, with a small budget, the ecosystem. Now, it was very hard to get an effective commitment from entrepreneurs in this, but it was actually quite easy to get good commitment from universities. From the city level, commitment was very low, but it created a good atmosphere for the ecosystem itself. Um, I think that, especially in Amsterdam, they were also invited here. I think they've done better than we did in Utrecht, in a sense, uh, because they are so big and so chaotic in Amsterdam, but still the economic board of Amsterdam made big steps with respect to smart cities. So it was actually, the helpfulness of government was that at the province level, these economics boards were created and they were effectively the ecosystem itself. So there was a vision behind that. Yeah. Yeah. You do it in English, probably. I have a question to you. In, in UN academia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in UN, we, we are working with some national governments in order to study the, the territory and to see how we can reconfigure some of the, the work of cities and to change the face of some of, of yeah. the cities, much more in a territorial perspective to bring some balance and to make sure that cities of all sizes can play a role in national development. And often in these proposals, obviously working with national government mostly, 
we can understand that some cities may have the possibility of becoming knowledge cities in, in Cornwall. Here, uh, my question to you is, is less this entrepreneurial uh, environment that you are describing us into much more a, a national perspective of, of territorial development. How do you see this conversion and what kind of problems do you identify in this? Okay. Um, I also saw your CV, of course. Um, um, I also work a lot in Africa, uh, Kampala, uh, Dar es Salaam, but also in the in thing. My first, my, first my first big problem that I see in this is that uh, at the city level, the complexities are so big with respect of migration to the city, environment, entrepreneurship, dislocation with respect to entrepreneurship, that the complexity itself becomes a problem in actually solving it. We don't know enough how the complexity at the city level works. So that is, I think, the first thing, is that, that we, 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 we have no models to cut easily through that type of regional city type of planning. That's one. The other problem, and it's more difficult probably to assess in this area, is the political one. So if you talk about um, Uganda, if you talk about Tanzania, then you have to be aware that we have seen a major shift that cities have become the big opponents of the rulers. So if you talk about Museveni in Kampala, if you talk about um, Megafuli and Dar es Salaam, Many other cities, the cities are the biggest opponents at the moment to the region. So the support for cities to become the engines in national level change among current governments in developing and, and, and emerging worlds is pretty low because it is organizing their own opposition. So after a long period of decentralization, that we have had under World Bank programs in the 1990s, you see now a retreat to fiscal centralization away from the cities. So what I see as a big problem nowadays in city engines for development is that on the one hand, they become the engines for entrepreneurship, but on the other hand, they are starved by cash from fiscal centralization. And, and I have the impression, let me put it that way, that in Russia it's the same. Yeah. So I'm not saying that here, but I have the impression that the problem is exactly the same here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for your your, your presentation. I think we have here a major uh, space for debate. Yeah. yeah. I was asked for the barriers, eh? so I, I see a lot of things going well, but... No, but I, I think you, you make a, a very, very strong point that is sometimes we tend to underestimate the magnitude of issues cities have to deal for themselves. Um, this might be true in Kampala, yeah. this is true in Paris, this is true in yeah. cities also. And uh, the more I am looking at the issue, the more I found cities might not alone
but not small. Uh, it's not super small. And uh, there is an ambition to grow rather quickly to multiply this amount by, by 10, which means that um, also with an ongoing change of organization, um, uh, it's not just entrepreneurship, it is also about how to support and fund entrepreneurship that is uh, something uh, very much uh, on the table and on the agenda, uh, connecting place with others, with Moscow, with Singapore, etc., through, uh, through Siberia. So I think it's uh, your, your uh, presentation and the, the kind of uh, tools you are bringing to the table that is uh, uh, taking place at a moment where a number of green lights Let me briefly comment also with respect to the time, also because I want to say something positive also about cities. I think, I think the, uh, an, a research question is why are cities so good in creating entrepreneurship? Um, and I think a lot has to do, and I've not mentioned that, maybe a bit in the ecosystem, but is, it is what we would call a diversity bonus. So, um, not so much a, a, a gender diversity, but the, the, the great thing about universities is that they have the unique capability of combining people with different skills. And I think where entrepreneurship often comes from is combining people with different skills. And that you cannot do in a village, but you can more effectively do it in a city. And I think that if you have a strategy of why cities work and how ecosystems work is how do you connect people with different cognitive skill sets, different backgrounds, different experiences? Because that is really where the city itself adds a lot of value. And you see many of these theories of the, the creative class, where people first meet in the opera, you should have an opera in Tomsk. Because if people meet there, uh, they, they come from different backgrounds, and that's, that is the diversity bonus, bonus uh, that uh, that entrepreneurship taps into. So that's my positive thing. Why why are cities so good actually in creating economic development? It's of creating that. Yeah. Um, I'm just talking about UA theory. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if I comment on the UK, yeah. because I want to make a general point on that as well, um, is that the UK, and now I'm overstating this a bit, has no centers for entrepreneurship. Not many. You know why? Because they have centers for family business, they have centers for entrepreneurship, but not for, uh, centers for enterprise, but only recently for entrepreneurship, because they hate the word. Because yeah. entrepreneurship is associated with making money over the back of others. And, and you see that, that from a cultural perspective, you have to be very careful with overstressing entrepreneurship. And there are many universities who only very late came to use the word entrepreneurship not to offend these type of identities and how people actually use the words, which I always find an interesting story from my friends from the UK in actually building up centers for entrepreneurship. Especially about social enterprise. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing that we yeah, but social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, I have to be very, very pragmatic about that. I, we introduced social entrepreneurship big time in university because we want to have university-wide participation and to get psychology, social sciences, governance in entrepreneurship, you need to have social entrepreneurship as a program. Not maybe because you like social entrepreneurship, it's good in itself, but to engage university-wide people in, in, in entrepreneurship, this is crucially important. Yeah. Students like it. <laughs> okay, I see that we have already run over time. Thank you very much, I'll be around and I see you.